The following message is by Pastor John Piper. More information from Desiring God Ministries is available at www.desiringgod.org. I hope that you will take your Bibles now and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, to Hebrews 5, verse 3. And if you're going to use the Bible in the pew, underneath the pew in front of you, it's page 1423. Hebrews 4.14 through chapter 5, verse 3. Starting now at verse 14, I'll read it with you. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself is also beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. Father, my prayer as we look at this passage of Scripture which you inspired and attempt to unfold it, that you would draw near and you would save and you would strengthen. For those outside Christ, I pray that the word would prove to be a compelling, winsome, persuasive word about your superior value, beauty, and truth over all else in the universe. And for those inside the faith, I pray there would be renewal and restoration and reform and strength and emboldening and reconciliation and healing and that every good thing appointed for us in Christ Jesus would go deeper, wider, higher, and that we would become a stronger church because of this word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever asked the question, why it is that God waited so long to send Jesus into the world? We fell at the beginning. Sin was there. Uh, then there was a great flood, and then there was a tower of Babel, and then there was the choosing of Abraham, and still no Jesus. Why didn't he come just before the flood? Why didn't he come just after the Tower of Babel? Why didn't he come, say, maybe during the time of the bondage in Egypt? I mean, God could have figured out a way to do that. Why wait so long, way down history, before the Son of God comes into the world? Now, it would be a big mistake to answer that by saying, well... Uh, the world sort of runs on its own. God set things up and history runs on its own. And God was looking for a good time to do it and he couldn't find it. Just no good time. So history's just making it along there and God is saying, what about here? No, that wouldn't work. What about here? No, that wouldn't work. That's a total mistake for a very simple reason. History doesn't run on its own. God runs history. We know that because Daniel said, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him, and it is he who changes times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. So it is wrong to look at history and say, Well, God was watching for a good opportunity, and there were no right kings and the no right seasons and no right epochs, and he just had to wait, and then all of a sudden there was the fullness of time, and he got him in there just in time. 
total wrong view of history. Because God's raising up kings. He's putting down kings. He's designing epochs. He controls culture. This world is in the hands of a sovereign God. You remember, Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that the hard way and went absolutely insane because he couldn't grasp it. And then when his fingernails were as long as eagle's claws and his hair was like bird's feathers, he finally came to his senses and he said, His dominion, God's dominion, is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. And he does according to his will in the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? So this first idea that Jesus didn't come for a long, long time because history just wasn't in an opportune way and God couldn't find a place to stick him in betrays a terrible view of God. Very unbiblical. Here's a second wrong reason for saying that Jesus waited so long to come. Namely that, well, God hadn't decided to send him yet. He was trying other ways of salvation. So he's trying the, the way of Noah, then the way of Abraham, and then some mosaic stuff, and then some prophetic stuff, and nothing worked. And so God said, well... Nothing else has worked. I'll send Jesus. That's wrong. And the reason we know it's wrong is because 2 Timothy 1.9 makes real clear that Jesus was planned to die and release grace for forgiveness before the world was created. I'll read it to you. 2 Timothy 1.9 God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. So the grace and the purpose to save you in and through the shed blood and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was planned from all eternity. History is not God trying to figure out a way to get salvation done. It is designed in order to make a way for his plan in Jesus. So the question remains, why wait so long? What was God doing in waiting so long before he sends Jesus into the world? Now, here's one answer. It's not the only answer. We have to give more answers than this, but here's one very, very important answer, and this really does relate to the text this morning. The answer, this answer, is that in order to make sense of Jesus, the coming of a heavenly being, very God, the Son of God, into the world in human form, in order to make sense of that and figure out who he was and why did he come, you got to have some categories to understand him. you got to have a context in which to put him and say, oh, he's coming to do this and he is like this. And that's why God designed the whole history of Israel. God took 2,000 years, roughly, from Abraham to Jesus in order to put in place a whole lot of categories, a whole lot of context, that when Jesus enters into it, will shed light on why he came and who he is. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there's a evangelistic strategy and a teaching method called Firm Foundations. It's being used as a curriculum for some of our children. It was used in an evangelistic Bible study for some folks in the neighborhood. It was used by New Tribes missionaries among the Mok people in New Guinea about which the film e Tao was made. And the gist of it is you don't present Jesus until you take weeks and sometimes even months to lay the groundwork of the Old Testament redemptive history that God designed so that when Jesus came, he'd make sense. It's a great video. I encourage you to get it. E-Tau. 
it's called. If you want to see how a tribe recognized Jesus after a groundwork was laid. I mean, imagine a village or a person in America who's never been to church, say, who doesn't conceive of a creator God, doesn't know anything about a fall into sin, doesn't know anything about a giving of a law, doesn't know anything about priests or sacrifices or prophets or kings or anything in the Old Testament, and you come up to him and say, Jesus came into the world. It's good news to save you. I mean, that is total gobbledygook. You've got to have a context. You've got to have categories. You've got to have something to put that on so that it stands and doesn't topple over and makes sense. Now, some people say, well, let's use contemporary categories. Make him intelligent because all those old fashioned categories nobody knows anything about anyway. So let's call him a coach or a therapist or a hero or something today. Just use a contemporary category and help modern people catch on to who Jesus is. Now, the problem with that is that even though there's probably truth in every one of those categories you can think of, they will definitely mislead you. And they will not take you to the bottom of who Jesus really is. To get to the bottom, you have to say, okay, maybe we'll borrow a few contemporary categories to shed a little light on Jesus. But not before we take biblical categories, biblical context, namely what God put in place in the Old Testament, and make sense out of Jesus with those. God designed Israel's history so that when Jesus came, he would make sense in light of that history. That's why it is there. And we impoverish ourselves and our understanding of Jesus if we jump over that straight into contemporary categories. We need to go back. And therefore, I say, hooray for the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews is tough sledding in places but it is the one book in the New Testament more than any other book that wrestles with these Old Testament categories, these Old Testament people and processes. And you wonder, why were they there? And the, and the book of Hebrews is designed to wrestle with them until they shed tremendous light on who Jesus really is. And then, having understood that, we move on into the 20th century and we say, aha, so maybe there's some analogies here that will help hook into where people are. Let me illustrate from verses 1 to 3 here. Um, the Old Testament, you know, is, is all about pointing to Jesus. I mean, Jesus said, remember, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that bear witness to me. Jesus is the one toward whom everything is pointing. Now, I don't mean that we allegorize every stick and stone in the Old Testament and say, oh, that stick, that's the cross, you know. That's, that's not right. But everything in its proper context and understanding is pointing beyond itself. You read the Old Testament and again and again and again, you scratch your head and say, but it's not complete. It's not perfect. It's not adequate. It's not enough. These blood of bulls and goats just can't buy forgiveness for my sins and on and on. And you get the impression this book is chapter one. This book is prolegomena. This book is a primer. It's pointing. If you don't take the next course, it's not complete. It's all pointing toward Jesus. Now, the category in this text, verse 14, is the high priest. That's why I'm saying what I'm saying. There's no high priests around today. And so, we say, are you going to understand Jesus as a high priest? They say, what's that? So if you're going to understand Jesus as a high priest, you got to step back and say, now did Jesus or did, did uh, God or the writer to the book of Hebrews choose high priest because he looked around and he found, oh, we've got some high priests in the Old Testament. Let's make them the analogy and we'll call Jesus high priest because that'll shed light on what he did and who he is. That's not the way to think about it. The way to think about it is that God 
before the history of Israel said, I want Jesus known as a high priest. Therefore, I'll create Israel. And I'll design a priesthood with sacrifices and bloodshedding so that when I send my son, he will have that with which to be understood. You see, you, you get into real wrong ways of thinking unless you believe God runs the world. If God doesn't run the world, he's always playing catch up ball and looking to figure out what to do with what comes into being on its own. And so, hmm, oh, I see. There is a, a high priesthood in this religion, and so I'll use that as an analogy for how to understand my son. Wrong. God was figuring out how to understand his son, that is, how to present him for understanding, long before there's any Israel. And so he shapes the history of Israel as a perfect backdrop for which to understand Jesus. Which is why, by the way, well, it's not by the way, it's right at the center, which is why... You can't jump over the categories of the New Testament like high priests and say, oh, man, there are no high priests around today. And you use that language. Nobody computes. You got to find something like modern and that'll work. That really flies in the face of a sovereign God of history who designed all of the Old Testament to happen and to be written down. So that when Christ comes into the world, missionaries in Papua New Guinea could go to the mock people with the Old Testament and take four months teaching the outline of Old Testament history. So that when Jesus is announced, they explode for two hours and carry the missionary around on their soldiers, rejoicing in forgiveness of sins. That's why we have an Old Testament. All of you church people, most of you here are probably church type people. Our job is to leaven pagan American culture with categories that God designed for understanding Jesus. You can't rewrite Jesus for the 20th century with contemporary categories. It cannot be done. You'll destroy him and you will deny in the process that God is sovereign over history, preparing a book called the Old Testament with which to interpret Jesus. Judaism just put this in as a parenthesis. There are temples, Temple Israel, Temple Aaron. There are temples in this city for a very clear reason, to bear witness that God's not done with what he began. The existence of the Jewish people is a massive statement that all that stuff is relevant. Paul said, you Gentiles are Johnny come lately's broken off branches or wild olive branches grafted into the old olive tree. And they too, if they don't remain in unbelief, will be grafted back in, the Jewish people. Because we all live by the rich root of the olive tree, namely the covenant with Abraham. You try to reinterpret Jesus for contemporary categories and leave aside all of that massive Old Testament preparation and you will simply ignore God and create right out of your own head things that will be very thin and misleading. Now, I said a minute ago, prematurely, look at verses 1 to 3 of chapter 5. I'm back to that point now. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, verse 1, says that these priests in the Old Testament were appointed on behalf of the people. They came from among people, and they were appointed on behalf of the people. They offer gifts. They offer sacrifices, dead animals, animals who have to be killed. And they offer them to God, and they offer them for sins. Now, just stop there. And think about that verse. You talk about a world view change. I mean, picture yourself as a people who knows nothing. And here you have God. Here you have sin. And evidently this sin has caused a breach or an alienation between God and man because you've got these priests who are human. And those priests evidently do something with animals who get sacrificed so that there's blood shedding. And that must have something to do with how sinful humans and holy God get right 
with each other. Now that's a massive worldview. And if you don't buy it, if you don't have it, that there's a God, there's sin, there's alienation, there's a way to connect through a sacrifice, if you don't get that, you'll never get Jesus. Never. Isn't that amazing? That one verse can unfold a whole worldview. You know, there are a lot of people today who just say, well, he's a good teacher, or he's a great example, or he's an inspiring friend. And they don't get the main problem. God, holy, man, sinner, breach, alienation, judgment, wrath, and hell. And we need more than anything else, not a teacher, not a friend, a reconciler, a priest, a bridge, a sacrifice. If you don't understand Jesus in terms of these Old Testament categories designed by God from before the foundation of the world for our good, your grasp of Jesus is so thin and superficial. Look at verse 3. Now this is important. We're on chapter 5, verse 3. This is why I tagged on these next three verses to the text. What you see in verse 3 is an inadequacy of the Old Testament priesthood. And the inadequacy you see there is that the priest has to offer sacrifices not only for himself, I mean, not only for the people, but also for himself. Now, that's big trouble for the priesthood. That means the priesthood will never be as sympathetic with us as we would like because they're sinners. Sinners are selfish. It means that he never, this high priest in the Old Testament, never enjoys abiding permanence in the presence of God. He could die at any moment and be cut off. And then what do we do? Quick, we got to find another priest to intervene for us. And it means thirdly, that he has no close place to God because his sin is always pushing him the other direction. Now that's an inadequacy. And the reason it's there is very simple. It's pointing to something else. The whole priesthood, the whole category of high priest in the Old Testament, which God designed as inadequate, is to point to Jesus. So that when he comes and presents himself as a high priest, we recognize that he's the end point of it all. Now, with that backdrop, let's go to verse 14 through 16 and briefly see why it is such good news for us to have a high priest. We 20th century people who don't have a, the, the category of high priest in our culture can learn it from the lesson book of Israel and revel in it and teach it to the nations. Verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God. Now, this is a stop before we get to the then clause. If we have this great high priest, there are three things to learn here. One, Jesus is alive. Two, he is above the heavens with God. Three, he is the Son of God. Now, take those one at a time with me. Jesus is alive. All those other priests lived and died and had to be replaced. Jesus lived and died and lived again with the sacrifice of his own blood, never to be replaced, which is why there aren't any high priests today. You know, if you complain, oh, there aren't any high priests around to understand Jesus with, and you wish there were, then you are fundamentally misunderstanding why there aren't any. Namely, Jesus ended it. He is alive. And since he's alive, he has his priesthood, chapter 7 says, by virtue of an indestructible life. Last night, Tom Steller called me while I was working on the message. And uh, he said, am I interrupting you, John? And I said, no, I'm just... Worshiping my way through the message. And what I had in mind 
was write this point because I've been over this message about three times before I preached it the first hour this morning. And at every time when I got to this point, he's alive, I couldn't help but pause. And one time tears just welled up and I thought, you are alive. You, not it, not once upon a time, not someday, but you're alive. Are you worshiping right now? Does your heart leap up and say, you're alive. You're alive. You're with the Father in heaven, interceding for me. The second thing, I've already said it, I'll say it again. He is above the heavens. He went through the heavens. You saw him there. Acts chapter 1, he goes into the clouds, through the heavens, out, and has arrived in that other dimension of reality called heaven, the place of Almighty God. And there he enjoys fellowship with his Father and intercedes for us. It says in chapter 7, he always lives to make intercession for us. The Holy of Holies that was in the tabernacle in the wilderness, that was in the temple in Mount Zion, city of David, is now obliterated and restored to its original in heaven. And he doesn't just enter in once a year, he enters in permanently. And there he communes with his Father every second of your life on your behalf. And the third observation is that he's the Son of God. And you know why that's important in verse 14? Jesus, the Son of God, it's this reason. He does not take the blood of bulls and goats when he enters in. And he does not take the blood merely of a man. He takes the blood of the Son of God. Now this is important for you to hear because you need help when Satan lies to you that there is no hope for you. You know what God says? You know what God says? When Jesus brings his own blood into the Holy of Holies and holds out his pierced hands and presents his sacrifice to the Father, Almighty Creator, Holy, Just God looks upon that and says, That is enough. Guilt is covered. Curse is removed. Alienation is overcome. You, John Piper, in Jesus Christ, are acquitted, justified, accepted, welcomed, because my righteousness has been vindicated and my glory has been honored. Honored. Come on in. You need to hear God saying that over you, because if he didn't say that, he would dishonor the blood of his son. This is good news. This is why we have acceptance with the Father. It was the Son who entered in as high priest. Now look at verse 15. In spite of the fact that verse 14 presents a a magnificent and lofty great high priest, verse 14, I mean 15, describes him in another way. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Notice three things. One, he was tempted like you are. Two, he never gave in to temptation, never sinned. And three, he is very sympathetic with us in our weaknesses. Fifty years ago, C.S. Lewis was pondering this text and he heard an objection raised by a scoffer. And the objection went like this. If Jesus never sinned, he can't know what real temptation is like. He can't sympathize, he can't empathize with me because he's never tasted the full force of temptation. And this is what C.S. Lewis wrote in response. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie 
Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. And I might add, or a lifetime later of hanging in there with a tough marriage and resisting the temptation to bail out. Or of hanging in there against sexual temptation and resisting the temptation, not just five minutes or one hour, but year in, year out, decade in, decade out, until Jesus comes or calls. We talk about knowing the force and power of temptation. Only those who do that. Know the full force. And so, Lewis says, that is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means the only complete realist. Don't you ever think that because you have lived, lived a life of sin that you know more about temptation than the godly person who has walked that razor's edge of the straight and narrow, gritting his teeth in the power of the Holy Spirit and saying, no, 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 and fighting his way through every day with righteousness and laying his head down and feeling the force of evil upon him day after day after day and triumphing over it in God. Don't you ever think that you know more of evil than that person or that you know more of evil than Jesus Christ? Tempted as we are, yet without sin, and therefore knowing the full force of what it is to be tempted. Let me illustrate for you. Jesus was tempted to lie, to save his life. Would you not, surrounded by soldiers, spears, a cross in the corner, nails on the floor, hammers over there, having seen what it was like when they asked you, Are you the Christ, the Son of the living God, be tempted to lie? He was tempted to steal, to help his mother when his father died, I do not doubt. There were at least five kids in that family. Widows don't make it easy. Joseph disappears off the scene early. Jesus was tempted to steal. Jesus was tempted to covet all those things, those nice things. Things Zacchaeus had even after he gave away half his goods. He was a rich man. And Jesus walked out owning nothing. You think he was not tempted to covet his own home, a place to lay his head down every night. He was tempted to dishonor his parents when they were tough on him and told him what was right and wrong and set limits, perhaps more than the other boys in Nazareth. He was tempted to take revenge when he was wrongly accused. So often they said lies about him and with one word he could have made fools out of them. He was tempted to lust when Mary knelt down, leaned over and wiped his feet with her hair. He was tempted to murmur at God's sovereignty when his friend and colleague and brother John the Baptist was beheaded at the whim of a dancing girl. Where are you, God? He was tempted to gloat over his accusers when they could, couldn't answer his questions. He knew the battle, folks, and he triumphed over that monster every day, all day, for 33 years. And when it crescendoed at the end, he never, ever gave in. Now let me close by pointing you to verse 16. The conclusion that we draw from all of this, that we have a great high priest, that he is the Son of God, that he has passed through the heavens with God, that He is sympathetic with us. The conclusion to draw is 
that we can draw near to God for grace. Let me pose a problem as we close that has kept many people away from Jesus. And I want to make sure nobody falls for this. Because there's so many people, I've talked to so many, I've heard of so many, who they get to the crisis point of whether to embrace Christ as their, their high priest, their savior, their lord, their king, their guide, their friend, and they push it away. Here's why. Many of them do. Everybody in this room knows that you need help. We need help with our bodies. We need help with our minds. We need help with our jobs. We need help with our spouses. We need help with our kids. We need help with our finances. We need help with our choices. Everybody knows we need help. And there's a second thing everybody in this room knows in your most honest moments. You don't deserve help. John Piper doesn't deserve any help from anybody. Why? I'm a sinner. I deserve one thing, judgment. I don't deserve help, so here I am. I need help to live my life and cope with eternity, and I don't deserve help. Now what are you going to do? This is the trap that keeps many people away from Christ. you got maybe three or four options. Here's number one. You can deny it all and say, I'll be a superman or a superwoman and rise above my need for help. And that might last a year, decade, and then you break. Or you could say, I can't deny it all, but I can drown it all. And you throw your life into a pool of sensual pleasure. That's a possibility. The third option is very common. It's looking, I need help with my life. My life doesn't work. I'm not in control. I especially can't handle my sin and my eternity. And over here, I don't deserve help. Because nobody owes me anything because I'm a sinner. I have wrecked things so many times. And my attitude stinks and I don't love God the way I should. Paralysis. And hopelessness. And you present the gospel to a person like that. If they don't have ears to hear... They just say, there's no way. There's no hope for me. But now there's a fourth option. And that's what the Bible is about. That's what history of Israel is about. That's what this text is about. And the option is, there is a high priest who is the Son of God, who takes the blood of His own death into the presence of God. And He enables us to say, yes, I need help. Yes, I don't deserve it, but no, I will not be paralyzed because there is a mediator and Jesus came to give the undeserving help. What do you call that? The throne of grace. Say it again. The throne of grace is God meeting the need of undeserving people. You've got to hear that now. I want you to take that out of here in about one minute. Grace comes into your life when you are paralyzed with the sense that you need help and you don't deserve help and therefore you feel hopeless and you're either going to superman it out or drown it out or be paralyzed with depression. And grace comes in and says, yes, you've analyzed that rightly, you need help. Yes, you've analyzed that rightly, you don't deserve a thing from God. But no, you don't need to be a superman. No, you don't need to drown it. And no, you don't need to be paralyzed. The fourth option is, I paid for that sin. And while you don't deserve any help, God will give you help if you come through a high priest. Don't miss the words in verse 16. Come boldly before the throne of grace to find not deserved help. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. If that's keeping you from Jesus, forget it. You never will deserve anything from Jesus. I tried to share the gospel with a man on the street about a week ago. And I felt led just to say, you know, the greatest news in all the world is that Jesus came so that we could be forgiven apart from any of our own works. His 
first response was, oh no, oh no, we got to do something to deserve it. That was his first response. The human heart, even in its despair, wants to say, it's hard, you got to have something I can do. And the whole point of this text is, the high priest has made the throne of Almighty God into a throne of grace, and when you go there, you find first mercy, pity, and then you find grace to help in time of need. So here you got a problem this afternoon, or you got a problem with your eternity, forget it. You're never going to deserve help, and that's okay. The glory of the gospel, the power of my life, the reason I'm a pastor and the reason I'm a Christian, the reason I love what I do, is that I've got the greatest news in all the world, that helpless people who don't deserve a thing can be saved can have fellowship with God, and can have help day by day to live your lives. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I beg of you that those who are not Christians in this room, who do not embrace Jesus Christ alone as their high priest, their reconciler, their sacrifice would be saved. Would you make this message winsome, compelling, self-authenticatingly beautiful, fitting the experience that we have in our needs and the reality that we see in the world? Lord, do that. Let none leave, I pray, unbelieving. And strengthen your saints so that day by day we can come before the throne and with joy, in spite of all of our sin, find grace to help in time of need. Thank you for listening to this message by John Piper, pastor for preaching at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message to give to others, but please do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit Desiring God online at www.desiringgod.org. There you'll find hundreds of sermons, articles, radio broadcasts, and much more, all available to you at no charge. Our online store carries all of Pastor John's books, audio, and video resources. You can also stay up to date on what's new at Desiring God. Again, our website is www.desiringgod.org. Or call us toll-free at 1-888-346-4700. Our mailing address is Desiring God, 2601 East Franklin Avenue, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55406. Desiring God exists to help you make God your treasure, because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.